Hello everyone, uh, welcome back. Um, today we will talk about um, the um, what is called exploratory data analysis. Um, so whenever and wherever data are collected, you will examine them according to their level of measurement, assuming that you already identified what uh, the proper level of measurement for your data. So it is very important that you look at the data closely to find out what the data can tell you before you apply any fancy statistical analysis or modeling. So in statistics, an approach to summarize and visualize the data to have an kind of overview of them is called the exploratory data analysis. So the exploratory data analysis, or EDA for short, is really not about a special technique. Rather, it is more of a kind of a um, philosophical approach to data analysis to maximize insight into a data set collected, which was actively promoted by the American statistician John Tukey in the picture. So in a sense, it is like a, you know, let the data speak for themselves approach to uncover underlying structure of data and to extract important variables and also to detect um, if there's any uh, anomalies or unusual data, um, sometimes called outliers or extreme values. And also um, EDA um, is an approach to uh, test underlying assumptions uh, about the data and ultimately to maximize insight into data by placing them in multiple perspectives or multiple viewpoints. So EDA is um, kind of a more direct way to analyze data by rearranging, visualizing, and summarizing them in as many different ways as possible. So there are um, a number of different ways to explore data. Um, in fact, the very first thing you need to do when you have the raw data is to sort and count, uh, which are now almost completely forgotten steps in the age of computers. However, uh, we should remember that this is the very beginning of any analysis. So if you have a large data set, then many times uh, you want to divide it into several groups um, and then that can be quite useful to find out what's really going on and better yet um, you can display or visualize um, your data set which is at the heart of the um, EDA uh, because a picture can be a very effective medium to get the message across when it is drawn correctly <clears throat> And we will have a you know more more chance to uh, talk about these uh, visualization more detail as we go along, and finally we can summarize data uh, with a couple of numbers that represent the center center of a data set and how much overall spread there is from the center in the data set, which are called measures of central tendency and of dispersion. Now let's take a look at each step of EDA starting from sorting and counting with some data. So let's pretend that you are a lab technician who is responsible for taking care of lab mice. So here is um, the record of age of mice measured in weeks. So here the variable being measured um, is called the age of mice and the data collected for the variable um, are the number of weeks. So now when you have a data set like this, the very first thing you want to do is to count the total number of data. Um, this is important because the count can provide um, information about you know whether you measured everything you want to measure and sometimes there may be an extra data included that should not be there so um how many age data do you 
uh, do we have here? So uh, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And we have two rows of 11. So the total number of data here is 22. So when we um, report uh, the number of data, we typically use a small n um, for number, right? So n equals 22. So that is our uh, number of data set we have here. And by the way, um, what do you think is the level of measurement for the age data? So the age of mice, what is the level of measurement for this variable? Well, I'll let you figure it out. And so now we know how many um, uh, data we have for the uh, variable age of mice. Um, now the next step is to actually sort this data uh, to see um you know what's going on with this age of mice so let's just sort this in ascending order so once we sort them uh, this way we can see that the youngest mouse is 21 weeks and the oldest my mouse is 69 uh, 69 weeks um when you have a large data so even though you know this is not that large um, it is sometimes more useful um, to split the data into a manageable number of groups events or categories and count how many data would occur in each category or group um, so we can do so by making a what is called grouped frequency table um, as shown here so here i split the age range into five groups already for you and the first age group starts from 20 weeks and ends right before 30 weeks so here um, i have kind of a bracket notations uh, which you um, haven't seen this before so this um, square bracket on the left of uh, the age limit, the, 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 the limit of the, uh, the group um, is um, meaning that this is a inclusive of the left limit. So this interval, this age interval will start from the 20, including the 20 up until 30 weeks exclusive of. So this round bracket means exclusive of the right, uh, um, the limit on the left of the bracket. And then we can start the next interval from exactly 30, including 30, and run up to week 40, not including that limit. In that way, we can have continuous, continuous intervals without any gap between the intervals. Okay, so let's just count um, how many data would fall in each age group. So for this 20 to 30, the first age group, we have 21, 27, but not 30, right? Because the first interval does not include 30. So we need to stop there. So the frequency or the count of observations or the data two for the first age group now we move on to the next age group running from 30 to 40 so we have this 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 till here so we have five of them right because we do not include 40 so that's five and the next 40 to 50 one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have eight. In the next group, one, two, three, four, four. And then the remaining data are three. Okay. So this is an example of a grouped frequency table. And 
as you can see, the middle age group is the um, the most frequent age group, right? So what we just um, uh, kind of calculated was what's called absolute frequency. Right? So that is the actual number of observations within an interval or a group. However, um, there are a number of different ways uh, to count the data or the, to calculate the frequency of data. So the cumulative frequency is a summed frequency up to the current and all the preceding intervals or groups. On the other hand, the, the relative frequency is the frequency of an interval or a group divided by the total number of observations across the intervals or groups. And finally, the cumulative relative frequency is uh, the cumulative frequency at the current interval or group divided by the total number of observations across the intervals or groups. So let's calculate the, uh, each frequency using uh, the uh, the mouse example, right? So this was the absolute frequency we just calculated, right? Um, now for the cumulative frequency, and by definition, it's a summed frequency up to the current frequency, right? because we do not have any preceding, uh, preceding um, intervals, um, because this is a first interval, and the cumulative frequency for the first age group is still 2. It is the same as the absolute frequency. But now, the cumulative frequency of the second interval is... ...7, right? Because the current absolute frequency is 5, and you want to add the frequency of the preceding intervals. So, the cumulative frequency for the second interval becomes 7. And now, the third one is 2 plus 5 plus 8. So that becomes 15. Okay, so the current frequency of the third interval is this, or you have to add this and that to have the cumulative frequency of the third interval, okay? So now the next one is just 15, move 15 here, and add four, that should 19. And then 19 plus three becomes 22. So please note that you have total frequency um, of the absolute frequencies, right? If you add all these frequencies up, right? Then it should become 22, which should be the same as the total number of observations you have. In the cumulative frequency, you do not have any total, right? But the last entry, the last cumulative frequency should be the same as the total number of um, observations for the cumulative frequency. Now, the relative frequency is the absolute frequency divided by the total number of observation. So that's 2 divided by 22, right? And the second, the relative frequency for the second interval is 5 over 22, 8 over 22, 4 over 22, and 3 over 22. And the total um, relative frequency should be 22 over 22, 1, right? So the total um, relative frequency should be always, always add up to 1, okay? And finally, the cumulative relative frequency is basically the, um, the relative frequency of the cumulative frequency. So 2 over 22. And now we're going to have to use the cumulative frequency, 7 over 22, 
and 15 over 22 19 over 22 <clears throat> 22 over 22 and there's no total for the cumulative relative frequency so this is how you calculate all these different frequencies now we can summarize these frequencies in pictures instead of numbers and it can be more effective way to summarize frequency information um, so we can visualize the frequency information in two ways depending upon the level of measurements so if you have a categorical data such as a nominal or ordinal level of measurements then a bar graph can be used as a graphical representation of frequency information so as an example let's say um, in the previous age data you know say 10 of them were male and remaining 12 were female um, because gender is a nominal variable a bar graph is a proper um, choice of visualization to display the frequency of each category so to draw a bar graph you need to draw the axis first then the categories of the nominal variable goes to the one axis uh, in this case the vertical axis right so we already have um, you know male and female as a category on this vertical axis um, and then the frequency information for each category goes on the other axis to show comparisons among discrete categories so like this so height of each bar should actually correspond to the frequency information so the male we have 10 and 12 for female right so bar graph can be useful to point out the order um, and the relative importance between different categories when there are many categories under a variable um, in addition, bar graph can be used for more complex representation of data by grouping or stacking um, when the variable is nested with subcategories. Um, so oftentimes we wish to compare the results of different surveys or of different con conditions or groups within the same overall survey. In this case, we are comparing the distributions of responses between the surveys or conditions. So the bar graph uh, uh, can be often, a, uh, often uh, an excellent tool for illustrating differences between two distributions. Um, this figure um, is known to be the first bar graph invented by the Scottish engineer William Playfair which first appeared in his publication called Commercial and Political Atlas in 1786. So in this grouped bar graph, we can see uh, the uh, Scotland's imports and exports in sterling pounds to and from 17 different countries sorted by the export amount represented by black bars. People sometimes like to add extra features to graphs just because they can and they think it looks cool and fancy. So for example, you have probably seen this kind of three-dimensional uh, bar graph before, but you know, usually this representation um, is not as effective as their two-dimensional counterparts because the extra added dimension does not convey any additional information and sometimes it may confuse more than help. So as a general rule, you want to minimize uh, any unnecessary bells and whistles in um, any visualization. Another way to visualize the frequency information for continuous data such as interval or ratio level of measurements is to use histogram. So what we see here is a histogram of 80 observations of intraocular pressure. So the pressure in the eye. Right? So it is typical that measurement values go to the x-axis and the frequency information um, 
go to the uh, y axis. So, with a large enough data set, a histogram can show the overall shape of the frequency distribution of the data. And please note that the bars are drawn to touch each other in histogram, whereas bars in the bar graph are not. So this is the major difference between the bar graph and the histogram, right? Because the histogram is used for the continuous data. So that, that's why the bars are touching to show that the variable we are you know, displaying is actually continuous. So there's no gap in the measurement, right? On the other hand, the bars in the bar graph are not touching each other because they are discrete, right? So they are not supposed to touch each other because they are not continuous. So that is the major difference uh, between the bar graph and the histogram. Um, it is a bit complicated to draw a histogram manually. I am, it is not really necessary to do so when you have a um, statistical software to automatically generate one for you. But to understand how it is uh, constructed, um, you know, will help us understand how to read the graph better. So as a first step, you need to determine how many intervals or groups you want to divide the data by. So it is not easy to decide as there is really no right or wrong answer on this one. But if you have too many or too few of them, then you won't be able to see the underlying distribution of the data. And in turn, it'll make the interpretation more difficult, right? Then make it easier. So um, there are uh, some mathematical equations you can use and the equation um, here is really uh, to give you some sort of guiding numbers to start with. So let's just use the second equation because it looks simpler. Um, and so because we have n equals 22, right? So we just take the um, square root of 22. And if we use calculator, So 22, so that's about 4.69, so, so um, that's 4.7, right? And then you need to round it. So if you just round it to the nearest integer, um, then it becomes five, right? So um, the number of intervals, um, the optimal intervals, uh, intervals will be five. So we will divide the data into five intervals. Um, even though it is not always the case that the bins are equal in width in general. So we will now we will need to uh, determine the width of each bin later on. And to do so, um, we need to calculate the um, the range of the data first and um, because we already sort the data the range is basically the uh, the difference between the minimum and the maximum values from the data set so that is 21 is the minimum and 69 is the maximum so you just subtract each other to give us 48 so 48 is our range well, that's what we just did and now you need to determine the width of the bin using this equation so the width of a bin is um, the rounded value of um, you know range divided by the number of bins so we just calculate the um so round range was 48 and number of bins that was decided to be five so if we that is 
9.6, right? So the width should be 10. So it is determined that the width of a bar, uh, the, the interval, yeah, the bar, yeah, should be 10. So it's a 10 weeks, right? And that's basically what we did before. So um, the range of the first interval is actually 10, like we did before. Right? It runs from 20 to 30. Okay? Um, so now we can count the number of observations or the frequency of observations for each group. And you just keep adding the interval by the width or the calculated number of bins, and then you can you count um, the frequency of observations for that interval, and we just keep doing until we reach the last interval, right? So now that we have um, our intervals and the width, we can construct a um, histogram by drawing a bar with height proportional to the count of each interval and width equal to the bin size. And you can keep drawing the bars abutting the previous bar until the last bin. So um, watch out the, um, the colors of the numbers that should correspond to the color of the bar. So the first interval, we draw a bar um, of which height is corresponding to the absolute frequency, so the black bar, and then we just keep drawing the bar right next to each other. So this is the, um, the um, histogram for the uh, absolute frequency. But now we can also um, draw a cumulative frequency histogram. So this is the um, cumulative, cumulative frequency for the first interval. And if we stack um, the bars for each interval, then we will have the cumulative frequency histogram. Yes. And, you know, by definition, the height of the last frequency, the last cumulative frequency histogram should be 22, right? Which is the total number of observations. Even though there is no right or wrong number of bins to have for any histogram, it will affect the shape of the histogram. So here we have a histogram of 1000 exam scores with 11 bins. And when we have such a large data set, then we can divide the range into a lot more bins. So for example, this is another histogram of the same data set now with 100 bins. And as you can see, as the number of bins increased, uh, the width of each bin decreased, right? So from here to here, you can see that um, the width of each bin is uh, now become much more slender compared to the previous one. And also as the uh, number of bins increased, the histogram looks smoother compared to the previous one, right? This one looks more kind of a steppy, you know, jagged, but um, this one looks smoother as we increase the number of bins. And also, um, as the number of bins increased, the, the max frequency, the maximum frequency of the distribution also decreased. So here, the, uh, the maximum frequency occurs around, say, like, 35 right but in the previous one now you know notice uh, you know change in the of a unit so this is about like a 270 right so these are the effect of um the number of bins on the shape of the distribution 